Hi everyone, welcome back to the Nico the Vet Show on YouTube. Um, today's topic uh, is a rather somber and slightly sort of, not depressing, but, but miserable subject of cancer in cats and dogs, and specifically uh, lymphoma, also known as lymphosarcoma. Now, just to re just start at the beginning and rewind a little bit, um, if you have a, a tumor or a growth on you, this is on you, me, the cat, or the dog, um, and, and it's, it's a growth of abnormal cells, we would immediately split this out into benign or malignant tumors. What that means is a benign tumor is something like a wart, in the sense that it's a lump of abnormal tissue, it shouldn't be there, um, but it pretty much sits where it sits. Let's say I had a wart on my finger. You've got the wart, it's a benign tumor. It sits there, it minds its own business. It might cause some local nuisance, but it's not going to spread to the rest of the body. Whereas your malignant tumors, which is what we imply when we say cancer, uh, malignant tumors are, are, are altogether different. They start anywhere you like, anywhere in the body, and it's often not where they are um, that causes the problem. It's the fact that they spread to other, other parts of the body. And think of it as you have the primary site growing. Um, so think about uh, breast tumors in, in ladies and in, and in dogs. Um, if you have abnormal tumor cells chipping off, they, carry, they are circulated in the blood supply, and they do a sort of a few laps through the body until that tumor cell gets effectively stuck somewhere and where it gets stuck it's either going to live or die and if it lives it's going to start growing as a tumor there and you've got a new tumor so you've got your breast cancer tumor now somewhere else the most common sites that these 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 things uh, would spread to uh, is anywhere with a very small blood vessel it makes sense if you think about this abnormal cell doing laps around your body, uh, it's not likely to get stuck in a big blood vessel, it's likely to get stuck in a little one. So lung and livers are the, are the common sites of spread, um, but by definition, cancers or malignant tumors can spread to any part of the body and indeed often multiple parts of the body. So lymphoma or lymphosarcoma fits into the nasty category. It fits into the malignant category or the cancer category that is going to spread through the rest of the body uh, and cause mayhem everywhere. So why is it called lymphoma? Uh, <coughs> with tumor terminology, the first part of the word tells you wh which tissue the tumor arose from, and then, then the second part uh, gives you some indication, uh, A, that it's a, a tumor, and B, whether it's a malignant or non-malignant. So lymphoma uh, or lymphosarcoma, lymph, lymph comes from your lymphatic vessels, your lymph nodes, your lymphatic vessels, your lymphatic system, and oma or sarcoma uh, means the, the tumor or the cancer. So effectively, it's a cancer which arises from the lymphatic tissue in our body. So what is the lymphatic tissue? Well, we have lymph nodes dotted around all over our body. So the, one that, the ones that most of us are familiar with are your tonsils. So your tonsils are, are just lymph nodes, they're lumps of lymphatic tissue. You, when the doctor checks you if you're ill, what they're feeling under your throat here is lymphatic tissue. And think of the lymph nodes as being like the police stations of the body, their, their job is uh, to monitor that local area of the body and if they pick up a problem, if they find a problem, if they see something abnormal, their job, just like police stations, is to react to that problem and often try to contain that problem to the area. So for example, uh, we, have, we, have, we have lymph nodes everywhere, you have literally thousands of lymph nodes and each will drain a segment. So uh, you have lymph nodes, like I said, in your, in your throat, in your neck, you've got lymph nodes in your armpit, lymph nodes in your groin. So if I had, if I had um, a, 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 something wrong with my finger, whether it be a, a tumor on my finger, or whether it be a cut or an infection or a trauma on my finger, the, the, the lymph node that monitors my, my arm is, uh, think about the, the lymph node as being the, the police station that's in my, in my armpit, and its job is to f see that there's a problem in my hand, and when it sees the problem, if it's an infection, it tries to contain the infection and so so sort it out and solve it before it gets to the rest of the body. If it's a tumor, and the tumor's trying to spread to the rest of my body, the lymph node's trying to sort of catch it, and, 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 and ideally, again, like a police station, lock it up and keep it there uh, to try to, to try to protect the rest of the body. So, so the problem with lymphoma is all the least little lymphatic or lymph nodes in our bodies are connected each other to each other by a super, almost like a super highway, which runs in tandem with all the blood vessels. So generally in your body, where you see an artery, which is blood, uh, a vessel carrying blood away from your heart, beside it will be a vein which carries the blood back to your heart and beside that will be a lymphatic vessel which really just travels with the blood vessels and, and the lymphatic vessels travels from lymph node to lymph node or lymphatic tissue to lymphatic tissue um, again like a sort of a super a super highway and your lymph, your lymph nodes are not just um, 
uh, isolated to actual nodes around the body. So like I said, you've got the one supplying your arm, but inside your lungs, you've got lymph nodes draining your lungs, you've got lymph nodes draining your liver, your kidneys, your bowel, uh, uh, um, and here within your bowel even, you have what we call payers patches, which are little blobs of lymphatic vessel, almost like lymph nodes, uh, but, but not quite, uh, in the sense that they're not isolated structures. They're uh, intimately involved in the intestinal wall. Again, their job would be to monitor what's going on in the bowel. So the, the, the train smash, the disaster of lymphoma is once any one cell in any of this lymphatic tissue anywhere in the body divides abnormally and forms a tumor cell, and that's how tumors form. Because remember, our body has a fixed number of, of chromosomes and very, very detailed information is held in each cell in terms of how to replicate itself to form another cell of the same. So remember our skin is replacing itself all the time. The lining of our, our, our intestines is, uh, uh, most of our, of our organs is replacing itself and repairing itself all the time. So, so this system, each cell has to, has, to, has to divide and replicate itself and make an exact copy of itself, copying all, just like a most a massive amount of data contained in the nucleus and in your DNA into the next one. So if it makes a significant mistake in terms of copying the information from one cell to another, and that cell then becomes abnormal, that's a tumor cell. That's, that's a, whether it be a cancer or a non-cancer, but that's a, that's a tumor cell. Uh, and that's why we can tell what tissue it came from, uh, but, but it's got some of the DNA wrong now. And then as that one replicates, you just start amplifying the, the error. And that's why the, uh, the tumor cells or cancers don't listen to our immune systems and don't listen to the rest of the bodies because they're abnormal, uh, think of them as abnormal runaway uh, rogue cells. So when this happens anywhere in the lymphatic uh, system, because it's all interconnected by these little tubes, and these tubes carry what's called lymphatic fluid, which is a clear fluid which communicates between the lymph nodes. Once you develop a problem in, in any one lymph node or any one bit of lymphatic tissue, it's connected by a superhighway to like a hundred or a thousand other lymph nodes. So the cancer cells or the tumor cells are spread very quickly from A to B to C to D. Whereas if I had a, a tumor anywhere else, like a, on the tip of my nose, uh, uh, it requires the blood supply. It needs to get into the blood supply and then it needs to get circulated around the body. Whereas the lymphatic tumors, they're already in the lymphatic system, they've already got access to the lymphatic vessels, so they spread very, very quickly and very, very early on in the course of the disease. Uh, that's why uh, if we sort of look at dogs and cats separately, so any part of the lymphatic system can become affected. In dogs, one of the most common parts are all the what we call the superficial lymph nodes. So they're ones we've touched on already. So it's the lymph nodes under your throat here, the lymph nodes in your armpit, the lymph nodes in your groin, and you've also got some behind your knees. And oftentimes I will see dogs presenting uh, uh, with what we call multicentric lymphoma. So it's multicentric, is multiple centers, and they'll come in and it will look like anything from golf balls to tennis balls, depending on the size of the dog, which have suddenly appeared uh, in what people will describe all over their body. But if you pay closer attention, you'll see they are sort of here, here, armpits, groin, and behind the, the knees. And often at this stage, the dogs will seem and, and act perfectly normally. They'll seem well, uh, appetite's good, everything is normal, other than these big, what people think are swellings beneath the skin. Uh, but very oftentimes, if they're in this, the, the sites of the lymph nodes, very often times we can, we can with certainty say, unfortunately, this individual has lymphoma because you've got these massive lymph nodes, suddenly massive, and the hallmark of these very dramatic cases is that they, it comes on almost overnight and it affects virtually all the lymph nodes we can feel. If we put an ultrasound scan or an x-ray on these guys and get some images, you'll see that often all the lymph nodes inside too, remember there are lymph nodes draining your abdominal organs and, in your, and, your, and, your, and the organs in your chest, and they'll also appear like this great big golf ball, tennis ball size masses. When you're presented with that, you can be pretty damn sure that that's what you're dealing with. To, to prove it uh, uh, and to confirm it, um, one would have to get some sort of biopsy. And for the biopsies, the options are the least invasive form is as a fine needle aspirate, which is just what it says it is. We take a normal needle that we would use for giving injections and we stick it into the, the tumor. And think of, think of the needle as being like an apple corer, which sort of goes in and it cores out a, a, a core of cells. Obviously being a needle, it's a tiny amount of cells that get into the needle. And you sort of core that out by sticking the needle in it a few times. Then we squirt out the contents of the needle onto a slide, uh, smear that and send that off to the laboratory for the histopathologists to look at. 
and geez, uh, uh, with, with lymphoma, 99 times out of 100, they will be able to give you the diagnosis based on just those very, very few cells. If that's not possible and they, and they just don't know or you're not getting a decent harvest or the cells are being damaged in the process of moving in and out of the needle, often we'll then send them a bigger piece so one can go in and do a, a bigger punch biopsy. Uh, I'll often just remove one, a whole one of the lymph nodes. People sometimes say, oh my word, you can't remove the lymph node. You know, it obviously serves a purpose, it's meant to be there. Uh, but no, like I say, you've got thousands throughout your system. So you can, you can stand to, to give up one or two for us to send to the laboratory to make the, the diagnosis. Uh, um, once you've made the diagnosis, um, you, then, the, you then consider treatment options. So in dogs, I find often the most common version is these huge lumps that arise under the skin. It's in the superficial lymph nodes, and it's a fairly obvious diagnosis. Uh, in cats, that uh, pretty much never happens. Uh, it can happen, but it's not a common presentation. Um, in cats, the versions that we see most commonly uh, are um, you get lymphoma growing in the kidneys or in the intestine. And these also are appallingly efficient at spreading themselves um, around the body, certainly initially through the kidneys or through the intestines, but from there to the rest of the body. And like I say they are appallingly efficient at spreading and seeding and moving themselves around. And often by the time we know what's going on, uh, um, um, by virtue of the fact that that, that cat has started to look unwell uh, in terms of uh, a change in, in their demeanor, a change in their thirst, a change in their appetite, a change in their character. Oftentimes by the time they feel unwell, the tumor or the cancer has significantly advanced and we're in big, big trouble with them. Often when these cats present to me, they have enormous kidneys. So the average sort of size cat's kidneys should be probably about, you know, Look at all my fingers, that, that sort of size there. Uh, you know, peach stone, smaller than a peach stone sort of size, three, four centimeters um, is an oblong sort of shape. And when we feel these cats, they, they feel often like, a, again, they've got golf ball or, or tennis ball kidneys. They're just massive, massive kidneys. Or we feel the equivalent in the, in, in the body, in the lymph nodes. So we feel these great big round balls or, or lumps uh, uh, in, in the cats when they presented for quite vague symptoms often of just not being quite right and perhaps a, a reduction in appetite. Dogs can present like that too. So remember, lymphoma can affect lymphatic tissue anywhere. So although there are trends, again, in dogs, look for the big lumps that come up over, almost overnight under their skin. And cats look for the cat who suddenly becomes extremely unwell. I don't expect the average person would be able to feel the lumps in the abdomen of a cat, but certainly the vet will. So once we feel these, and, and you, you, get that, you get past that sort of heart sink moment, once we've felt these, once we've taken the biopsies, once we've confirmed that that's what we're dealing with, the next question is, where do we go from here? Now, in human beings, they, they, they divide um, lymphomas off, uh, uh, into two main categories, uh, Hodgkin's versus non-Hodgkin's lymphomas. In the veterinary world, we talk about the two main categories are, 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 are B-cell lymphomas or T-cell lymphomas. A slightly academic point in the veterinary world, the B-cell the B cell lymphomas are, are probably slightly less aggressive than the T-cell lymphomas, but really, whichever one you've got is, 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 is a big problem for you. The reason I mention lymphoma in human beings, Hodgkin's versus non-Hodgkin's, is some cases of lymphoma in people will present also as just massive tumors, tennis ball sized tumors, often multiple everywhere in the body. And with human beings, um, depending on the type of lymphoma you have, you may well have a very good prospect of responding very well to chemotherapy and getting yourself into remission and then often staying in remission for the rest of your life. So effectively, in inverted commas, you've been cured of your, of your cancer. So in human beings, the outlook is, is very different to what it is in cats and dogs because in cats and dogs, when they develop lymphoma, yes, there, there are treatments we can give them, but they are not going to affect a cure. We're not gonna get you in remission to the extent that you live a, a, a normal lifespan, uh, tumor uh, and cancer free. So, so that's a rather depressing starting point is um, is when, we, when we've made this diagnosis, we are gonna lose. This, this individual will ultimately succumb to the disease. So they, if they've got lymphoma, they will ultimately die of lymphoma. So the object of treatment uh, in the veterinary arena is slightly less good, if that's the word. It's slightly, uh, slightly less good prospect for the patient in the sense that um, although we'll give you the treatment and oftentimes it'll make a huge difference I mean, to your quality of life uh, in the sense that you'll go back to feeling pretty much normal, it's not fixed you. Uh, so what are, the, what are the treatment options? So sort of the, the Rolls-Royce treatment option would be a quadruple chemotherapy. So effectively, that would be three uh, um, chemotherapy drugs 
and some steroids, some, some glucocorticosteroid or cortisone, uh, and they come together in a, in a package. Some of the medication is taken in tablet form, some of it is taken in intravenous injectable form. Um, it's a big commitment to this treatment if we, if we, if we go with the quadruple chemo uh, protocol. Uh, you, you, are, you, have to, you have to keep ongoing medications, you've got to keep taking medications, you've got to have monitoring blood tests to check how your bone marrow is coping with it all. So it is, it is a big commitment. Uh, and really what we're, what we're expecting with these guys is if, if they respond, and again, not everybody does respond, but if they respond, your best case scenario is probably six to 12 months of life from the time that we've made the diagnosis. On the point of the chemo, so even if we use the quadruple chemo protocols, Cats and dogs don't uh, appear to see or feel anywhere near as unwell as people do on chemotherapy. So, so, I, so some people say, "Oh, I just you know I've seen my auntie Mabel go through chemo, and I just wouldn't even contemplate it." In the dogs and cats, it's not necessarily a non-starter for those reasons, simply because they don't feel anywhere near as unwell as people do as a general rule. Of course, there are individual variations. So treatment options, you can go for the Rolls-Royce option, which is the quadruple. If you, if you respond and if, you, if, you, if you're one of the, the, the lucky ones, you may get, I would normally say to people, six to nine months, uh, but the oncologist will tell you probably six to, six to 12 months, maybe as much as 14 months, if you respond well and you go with the whole protocol. So one step down from that would be the, uh, the triple chemo protocol. So in fact, that's two chemo drugs with the glu uh, not the glucose, triple chemo uh, protocol would be two chemo drugs and one steroid, which is the cortisone. If you respond well to that, again, miserably, not everyone does, but if you do respond well to that, we would expect to buy you three to six months, again, of good quality of life, but only the three to six months. If we decide not to do the chemo, because if we do the chemo, we, we really need to commit to the monitoring blood tests and the ongoing administration of that treatment. So if people say, well, I, I just don't want the expense of it and I don't want the invasion of it, then the, the next option, and these are all sort of watered down versions, is just the steroid by itself, just the cortisone. In real terms, we give you prednisolone. And if you respond to that, uh, um, you would have two to four months time. If you do nothing, you've probably uh, uh, got a, probably less than two months from the time of diagnosis. So to sum up, if, you, if, if you've made the diagnosis, if we do nothing, uh, you've probably got two months. If we give you just steroid, you've got two to four. If we give you a triple chemo protocol, you've probably got three to six months. And if we give you a quadruple, you probably got six to nine. If you're very lucky, maybe as much as 12. So what's, what's, what's dispiriting about this is, um, despite what we do, um, you're, you're going to succumb to your disease. You will die from lymphoma. So what we're doing is we're buying you some time. And what's very important is uh, buying time per se is, is not a, a valuable thing. It's only buying good quality, healthy lifetime that is a valuable thing. For me, what I find dispiriting about the chemotherapy, chemotherapy protocols is, uh, is just the, how little time we get for these guys. Now, for some of us, that's very, very important, and we would invest all the time and the effort and the money into that, buying that bit of extra time, even though it's not a lot. Um, but some people would say, I just, I just don't want to go down that route, and often would just palliate um, with the steroids for a time. Uh, so it is depressing. It is depressing when we treat these guys. There's no right or wrong. You have to look at your own experiences of cancer and your own philosophies to life in cancer in terms of deciding what to do for these individuals. But with whichever protocol one chooses, again, the expectation would be quite a dramatic improvement in, in terms of their quality of life and how they feel to the extent that you question the diagnosis. You think, really, this, this, this guy looks absolutely fine. Uh, I mean, are we sure about this? And the answer is, yes, uh, we are sure. That just the chemo is working really, really well for you. Um, but again, it will come back at you. So even if one has committed to the chemo, um, even if you get a good result, you will reach a point where the, 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 the tumor will come back and it will be refractory, so it will not respond to the treatment anymore. And then there are very, various rescue protocols protocols that we could follow. So it's a different sort of chemotherapy protocol to buy you some more time. As a very crude rule of thumb, whatever amount of time you bought on the first protocol, you would get half or maybe less than half that amount of time on a rescue protocol. 
and ultimately we can reach a point where just nothing works and and um, <clears throat> if there's if there's suffering and there often is because these tumors spread throughout the whole body I don't think they cause pain it's not slam your hand in the door sort of pain but you just feel dreadful I take sort of the worst hangover you've ever had um, that's probably how these guys feel they just feel sicky they feel a loss of appetite they feel just unwell uh, and depending on where it's spread there may be some aching or some degree of pain but it's probably not it's not um, not slam your hand in the door sort of pain so it is it is a mis miserable condition it is dispiriting and there are some significant divergences from human lymphoma uh, so some of it is similar some of it is, is very very different particularly the prognosis the possibility of giving you back your your life so it's one of those things you do need to have a long hard chat with your vet um, it's very often it's time well spent uh, if you if you've been landed with this diagnosis of speaking to an oncologist get an idea of just what they can do what they can't do uh, um, they'll talk you through your, your options and then at the end of the day it is a very personal thing when one will decide what to do so so it is a it is a, a miserable a, miser a miserable topic to discuss but it's an important one because lymphoma is probably the most common cancer that we deal with in in dogs and cats and it's something that we need to understand as best we can, because if we're unfortunate enough to be confronted with this in our cats and our dogs, we need to understand what the implications of all our choices are so that we can make the best choice for them and for ourselves. Uh, so, so thank you again for tuning in and thank you as always for everyone who's sent their very encouraging comments. Uh, and um, and uh, the next topic, I think, will take a, a much lighter topic. So take care. Thank you again for signing in. Bye bye.